finish dismissing for Children's Church and Nursery Church, please open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 49 will be our text for this morning. Again, that's Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 49. Sometimes it's really easy for us to listen and to hear, but not always easy to follow through with what we hear and what we listen to. Um, I am guilty of this all of the time, and it's something I'm constantly working on, uh, especially at home. If Brianna asks me of a, a small favor, uh, Christopher, can you pull something out of the freezer so that it can thaw before dinner tonight? I stop. I hear and I listen and I say, yes, Brianna, I would be so happy to pull that out of the freezer for you. <laughs> and then I look back down at my work, my computer, my book that I'm reading, and two or three or four or five hours goes by and nothing ever gets pulled out of the freezer. Um, I'm sad to say that things like that do happen uh, often. But I'm working on it and trying my best to be a person who listens. I listen well, uh, but not just a person who listens, but a person who also does, who follows through, who says, yes, I hear you. Now let me help you as you request it. We're going to read in Luke chapter 6 today that we must be people who hear God's word, but also people who do God's word. Uh, so let's turn to the text this morning, let's read our text together, and then we'll go through the text one small portion at a time. Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 49. God's word says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked up from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house, who dug down and went deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Church, let's pray here and having heard the word of the Lord. Oh Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your instruction here that we must produce fruit if we indeed have the goodness of Christ in our hearts. We thank you for the admonition to listen and obey to all of your words, and we pray that we would take that to heart and do it this morning. Help us to understand these commands. Help us to understand this whole message that Jesus gave in Luke chapter 6. Help us to hear and to do. Oh Lord God, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Church, let's look at the first few verses of our text today, verses 43 through 45. And in this section, we'll see that good fruit comes from good trees. Good fruit comes from good trees. Again, this section says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a ramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. This text here and this description of good fruit coming from good trees follows Jesus' command to be merciful even as your father is merciful. Amen. Luke chapter 6 verse 36 says that very thing. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. Last week we saw that Luke 6, verses 37 through 42, further explain that command. And it concludes with this parable of the hypocrite, who has a giant beam sticking out of his eye, but he presumes to go to his brother and take a tiny speck out of his own. 
He says, I refuse to be merciful to you all and to forgive you all, but let me point out your sin to you. That person is the hypocrite. That person refuses to follow Jesus' command to be merciful. Right after this command to be merciful, Jesus gives us the reason why we must listen to that <laughs> command, why we must act upon that command. Verse 43 starts out with the word for, indicating that this is the reason, the, the ground, the, the, the uh, because of why we should listen to God's command to be merciful. We should be merciful because no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. Jesus gives the metaphor of a good tree. It's got good roots and a good central system that, that provides water up to the leaves, which collect the, the sun rays and produce good fruit. If the roots are rotten, if the core of the tree is rotten, it's not going to produce good fruit, not at all. But if it's a good tree, you'll see bright, plump, juicy fruit coming from that tree. In this parable, Jesus is again explaining the person who either shows mercy or does not show mercy. Jesus says if, if you are merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful, if your words speak mercy to the people around you, that is good fruit, evidence of a good core in your person, a good Heart. Jesus said earlier in Luke chapter 6 that blessed are you if you realize you are poor in spirit. If you come to me and follow after me and seek after me, then you have blessing from God. He says you can rejoice in that day for your reward is great in heaven. You've been reconciled with God. We learned when we looked through that, that portion of Luke chapter 6 that anyone who trusts in Christ has new birth and new life in their heart. And has a well, a spring of living water built up within them through the work of Christ, the Holy Spirit, in their lives. So if you trust in Christ, you have this new heart. And Jesus says, if you have a new heart, then that heart better be overflowing out of your mouth in mercy. And why? Because merciful words are the fruit of a merciful heart. A heart that has received great mercy. He says, you must be merciful to the people around you because I've been merciful, merciful in your heart. Your heart has been made good. Your heart has been made merciful, so it better be spilling out into good fruit around you. He says, no good tree bears bad fruit. If it's a good tree in your heart, then you're going to see that mercy spilling out of that person. But if your heart has not received mercy, if you have no mercy within your heart, then you're going to see that spilling out of your mouth. He gives two more related examples in verse 44. He says, For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. He says, If you want to see fruit produced in your life, then you need to have this mercy first in your heart. He, he, he's, gonna, he's, he's referring to the opposite as well. If you've got this mercy in your heart, then, then you're not going to produce thorns and, and brambles. You're going to produce tasty figs and grapes from the bramble bush. In verse 45, Jesus further explains this and tells us exactly what he means in this parable. Verse 45. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. The, the, the good person has a storehouse of God's mercy poured into their heart because they have turned to God in their hour of need. And God has poured out that mercy lavishly, as we saw uh, last week. Uh, a measure poured out that is so full and overflowing that our laps cannot contain the mercy that God pours on those who turn to him. If you have that storehouse of mercy within you, then it's going to pour out. The good person out of the good storehouse of his heart will see an overflow to the people around him. But the evil person who does not have that storehouse of mercy, that person is going to produce evil. And then he explains really clearly right at the end, and we see that connection to the previous text. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. This good fruit that Jesus is talking about, it's fruit that comes from our mouths to the people around us. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good fruit from his mouth. 
It comes out of his mouth, but the, the seat of that goodness is a heart made whole and alive by God in Christ. So church, the command here is to make sure our mouths are reflecting the good work that God has done in our hearts. How do we know if we have good or evil coming out of our hearts? We saw in verse 40, 45 that it is what comes out of our mouth that indicates the condition of our hearts. It's this good fruit, this mercy and grace, this when someone sins against us, forgiving them rather than condemning them. Mm -hmm. The command here, I think, primarily is Jesus telling us to produce good fruit. He says, you followed me, you have that well of mercy in your heart, then you must produce it and share that mercy with the people around you. I think Jesus here is commanding them to be extra careful what they say to others, because what they say reflects on their hearts, which are supposed to be turned, uh, changed by God. If their hearts truly have been changed, then their words should reflect that. So I think primarily Jesus is commanding us to produce these good works with our mouth. But secondly, I think also Jesus here is, is um, implying that we do some introspection, that we look at ourselves, that we evaluate and examine the fruit that comes from our mouths and see what it says about our hearts. Jesus says, look back on your words. Look back on how you interact with the people around you. Do your words indicate a wellspring of God's mercy in your heart? Or do they indicate a dead Dying, decaying, and evil heart. Mm -hmm. One day there was a church regular, a man who showed up, and he came to Sunday school at this hypothetical church. <laughs> this morning? Yes, this morning at a hypothetical church. A man shows up for Sunday school, and he looks across the hallway from his Sunday school class, and he sees an empty room. The teacher isn't there. Another man comes and sits beside him, and they both glance out the door, and that other man says, Hey, where is John today? Is he going to have his Sunday school class? And the first man says, Oh, you know what? John is late again. John is always late. Why can't he ever be here on time? Why are some people so lazy? They can't even get out of bed in the morning. A little while later, this hypothetical church member is walking down the hallway, and he sees a group of kids running down the hall, chasing each other, and laughing and making noise. And as he passes them, he leans over to the person he's walking with, and he says, Ugh, some parents just can't control their kids. Later, he sits down in the pew, and he opens up his bulletin, and he reads through it, and he leans over to his wife, and he says, Can't they ever just choose a good song to sing? These songs are always so boring, and they don't make much sense. Later that night, this church member sits down and he opens up for his daily devotional, Luke chapter 6. And he reads, for no tree, or no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does bad tree bear good fruit. In verse 45, he reads, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And he says, praise you, Lord, for I have good fruit coming from a good heart. He says, I'm so glad that out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth speaks. Oh, church, we must make sure that we produce fruit in accordance with that merciful heart that God has given us. We must be careful to produce good fruit, to produce good fruit. In other words, we must make sure that what comes out of our mouths is good and not evil. Jesus commands us to let only good come out of our mouths. Everything we should say should be filled with love and with mercy. We should never let evil thoughts, words, hatred, spite, malice, backstabbing, and slander or gossip pass our lips. Brothers, speak well to others. Speak well of others. And speak well about others. Church, we must do this all the time. We must not only do it when we think that no one is listening, for our God in heaven always is listening and always is with us. Second church, I think we need to do a little introspection in light of this text. Looking back on the last week, if you, if you look back on your last week, your last month, your last year, how would you evaluate yourself as far as your speech goes? Would you say that 
Your speech bears evidence to a good and, and merciful heart that God has made merciful? Or would you say that your speech reflects an evil heart, a graceless heart, an unforgiving heart? Church, if we take an honest look at our speech, can we honestly say that our speech has been full of mercy? Does your speech in the last month, the last week, the last day, the last year indicate a heart filled with God's grace and mercy? If not, church, then what does that say about your heart? Jesus says that a merciless tongue indicates an evil and merciless heart. So, church, let me ask you, is that you this morning? And if that is you, what are you going to do about it? The message for that person who has a merciless tongue is that we must get right with God. Mm. Brother or sister, repent of your sins and come back to the Lord. Yes. Before we knew the Lord, our hearts were dark and against God. We sinned against God, rejected God, and wanted nothing to do with Him. And thus we deserved death. We had hearts that had not yet been made alive in God, and we hated God. But then God sent his own son, Jesus, to die for our sins, to pay the price that we deserve. And then Jesus rose again to new life, yes. offering to all of us who would repent of our sins and trust in him new life as well. So if you're that person who has never experienced that overflowing of God's mercy in your heart, if you're that person who's never repented and trusted in Jesus, then you need God's mercy pouring into your heart so that you can pour out that mercy to others. So for you, the message is repent and trust in the Lord for the first time. But brother or sister, if you've been a faithful believer and follower of the Lord for years, and yet through a series of circumstances, you have a lot of dark Hateful, spiteful, malicious words that come out of your mouth. If you have, have felt that fading away from the mercy and grace that God has given to you, if you felt your heart start to turn back to the way that it was, though you know it will never turn back completely, for God Himself guards your heart in Him. And if you start to see it turning back, if you start to see those harsh words coming out again, then church, you must also repent. Brother, you must also repent and get right with God once more. Repent of that sin of graceless speech, merciless speech, and come back to the Lord and then seek to produce that good fruit that Jesus talks about here. So whatever your case is today, if you are that person who looks inward and says, my words have not been merciful, then Come back to God, get right with God, and produce good fruit from that good treasure that God has poured out in you. Let's move now to the next portion of our text, verses 46 through 49. Here we're going to see Jesus say, listen to my words and do them. Jesus is going to command that we listen to his words and we do them. So let's look at verses 46 through 49. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it has had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. In this parable, Jesus reverses the order he had in the previous one. In the previous parable, he gives the parable and then explains it to us. In this one, he states a command and then uses a parable to explain it. Jesus' command is in the form of a rhetorical question. He says, why do you call on me? And call me Lord, Lord. Why do you call me Master? Why do you call me someone that you're willing to follow? And yet you do not do what I tell you. You, you say you're my disciple. You say you follow me. You say you're faithful to me. But you don't do the things that I command you. You don't do them at all. Jesus says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, let me show you what this person is like. 
Jesus, again, he's talking to people who have come to him, have followed him, and they are people who are supposed to be doing what he teaches. Jesus, right now, in, in this section of Luke, is, is giving a sermon to all of his disciples and all these others who have gathered to hear him. And he says, if you want to be like someone who not only follows me and listens to me, but actually does what I say, then here's what you would be like. Verse 48, he gives the parable. He says, this man is like someone who has built a house, who dug down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Church, if you want to be a person who is built on a strong, sturdy, bedrock foundation, then you must be the kind of person that hears Jesus' words and does them. Amen. Not just hears them, but does them. If you want to be a person, if you want to build your house, your life on the foundation of God's word and on the foundation of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for us, then you must listen to Jesus and do what he says. Do what he says. He continues on to describe the opposite. He describes someone who hears God's word but does not do it and describes what that person is like. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Jesus talks, about, talks to people who are following him, and he talks about what it's like if those people hear his word and obey, or hear his word and forget. Jesus talks about a time when, when difficulty comes upon his followers. He says that if you want to be my follower and, and you want to, to be a firm and steady follower of mine, then when trial comes, I guarantee you'll have a foundation that you can hold on to that cannot be moved and cannot be changed. Yes. Yes. Jesus says, and when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it. But a little later, describing the person who built his house on the sand, he says... When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Church, no matter who you are in this world, there are tough times coming for us all. And I know all of you have experienced these tough times in the past, and you will continue to experience them in the future. Jesus says that these tough times are more pronounced for his followers. Because Jesus himself was persecuted. The prophets before him were persecuted. And those who follow Jesus and hold to his instructions will certainly face this kind of persecution as well. Everyone goes through tough times. Jesus says, I will be to you a firm and steady foundation. So that when those tough times come, you will not be shaken and you will not be but in order to be that kind of person, you must build your life and build your house on the good foundation. Jesus himself is that good foundation. His words and his instructions are that foundation. And he says, if you hear my words and obey them, then you are certainly built upon this solid rock foundation that cannot be moved. He says, but if you are a person who hears my words, who comes to church and, and hears from God's word or who reads the Bible themselves and hears the word and says, oh yeah, that's nice, but I'm going to do things my own way. Then Jesus says, you have no foundation at all. And when temptation comes your way, when trials come your way, when persecution comes your way, you will be swept away and the ruin will be great and disastrous. Jesus doesn't describe the particular type of of river that's coming at his disciples, right? It, it's a metaphor, and I think it has a general application here. Some have looked at this and said, well, Jesus is describing worldly persecution. And when worldly persecution comes against his people, they will have a firm foundation because they follow Jesus' word. But other people look at this and say, this, this river that comes against people is the end times. It's the judgment of God. And if they... His disciples want to have a firm foundation in Christ and, and not be moved by God's great judgment when he comes again. 
and they must build on his foundation. Uh, I think both of these people who say that are right. <laughs> I think generally Jesus is giving a metaphor to talk about uh, not just uh, end times judgment, but the kind of things that people experience here in this life. Jesus doesn't specifically talk about the kinds of things that they will be firm against. But he does say, no matter what the difficulty is that comes in your life, you will be firm against it if you are a people who hear my words and do them. If you do not do Jesus' words, if you merely hear them but ignore them, then when tough things come your way, even when God's judgment on that final day comes your way, you will be utterly swept away and destroyed because you had no foundation in Christ. Church, we must listen to God's words and do them. I know I've mentioned this story from C.S. Lewis before, but I want to mention it again because it's perfect for this situation. C.S. Lewis uses his own parable to describe this kind of thing here. He says, one day my wife and I left our house on an extended vacation. And we asked this young couple to come house it for us. And we gave them detailed instructions. On the first day, water these plants. On, on the first evening, give food to this animal and care for that animal. On the next day, water a different set of plants. Here are the detailed instructions. We've written them out for you, bullet-pointed lists. Do this, 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 and this. And our house will be well taken care of. The young couple comes in. They stay in the house. They, they read the instructions. They highlight portions of the instructions. Wow, this instruction is really good. I, I need to follow this one. And a month goes by, and C.S. Lewis and his wife return to their home. The house has been broken into. None of the doors were locked. Everything has been stolen. The plants are dead. The animals have, have run away and left droppings all over the house. And, and the owners of the house come in, and they say, what did you all do? Why, why didn't you follow the instructions that we gave you? And the young couple says, oh, those instructions were fantastic. We loved them. We read them over and over again. We read them once every day. We highlighted portions. We memorized them. Oh, they were fantastic. But then the owners of the house say, if you thought they were fantastic, why didn't you do what they said? Why didn't you care for our house? Why didn't you water our plants? Why didn't you give food to the dog? Church. For the last five weeks, we have been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. In verses 20 through 26, we saw that we are blessed if we realize we're, we're poor in spirit and have no spiritual uh, uh, benefit to give to God, but that we need Him wholly for forgiveness. Yeah. And if we come to Him for forgiveness, then we may rejoice in that day, for our reward is great in heaven because we don't have anything to give to Him, but He has everything to give to us. We saw that if we, we do not acknowledge our spiritual need of God, then woe to us, for we have already received everything we'll receive in this life. We saw in verses 27 through 35 that we must love our enemies and do good to them. Even when people hate us and, and revile us and sin against us, we must love them anyways. And be like a person who, when he's insulted on one side, says... I forgive you and is willing to be insulted again out of love for that person. We saw in verses 36 through 42 that we must be merciful to everyone just as God has been merciful to us. That we should not, not immediately condemn those who sin against us but offer them the same forgiveness God has offered to us in Christ. And in that way we must be like a sighted man leading a blind man, not a blind man leading a blind man. We must not ignore the mercy given to us and try to lead others to the same mercy that we ignore. And today we saw that we must not be a good tree that produces bad fruit, because such things aren't supposed to exist. We've seen all of these commandments in the Sermon on the Plain. We've heard Jesus' instructions given to us. So church, the question, the final question is, as he finishes up this sermon, this, this ethic given to his disciples, are you going to do what we read? Are you going to do what we read? Will you do all of the commandments in this section? Church, if you're going to obey these commandments, first you have to hear them and listen to them. Have you heard from God's word this week? Have you heard from God's word over the past five weeks? 
as we've looked at Luke chapter 6. All of the Bible is the very word of God, without error and perfect and good for our instruction and for our teaching and our training and our development in righteousness. Have you read God's word and are you listening to it? Do you hear it as we read from God's word this morning and do you hear it and see it on your own throughout the week? Are you hearing, are you listening to what Jesus has to say, what God has to say in all 66 books of this wonderful Bible? But church, are you also doing it? Are you also living it out? Oh, the challenge this morning, the challenge for you and for me, uh, like I've admitted, I don't always listen and do perfectly. I must listen as well. I must do as well. Church, all of us, are we doing what Jesus could? Have we come to him knowing that we need his grace? Do we love our enemies? Do we show mercy to others rather than condemning them? Do we produce good fruit with our mouths, fruit of mercy and grace? Are we doing all of that and therefore building our foundation upon Christ? Oh, church, are you doing that this week? And will you do that this week? We must hear and do. Let me pray for us, church. As we close. Oh Lord God, we thank you for giving us your word. Your word brings life to us. Your word teaches us how we can have a solid rock foundation. By first coming to Christ and hearing all of his words and then doing what he has commanded us. Oh Lord, please protect us and defend us from the difficulties in this world. We know they're coming like, like a river after a, a flood. We can't stop the flood from coming. We can't stop persecution from coming. We can't stop difficulty from coming. But when it comes, Lord, we pray that you would protect us, guard us, prevent us from being shaken by those who have no solid foundation. Oh, Lord God, I pray for each and every person that's here this morning, myself included, that we would listen and do Oh, Lord God, help us to be good trees that produce good fruit. And help us to love you more and more every single day. Amen. Oh, Lord God, give us a passion and a desire for you that wells up in our hearts to praise you and to good works in your behalf. We do love you, Lord, and we do trust you and praise you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.